Deer Creek Audio, your trusted technical resource. Today we're going to be taking a look at Mini DSP's new device console. The device console replaces the older Mini DSP plugin, which is the GUI for controlling your Mini DSP device. Device console will be the new graphical user interface for all of the Mini DSP devices, beginning with the 2x4 HD and going through the entire family, all the way up through the SHD Studio. If you have successfully completed the migration to Device Console from Plugin, which applies to older installations, or if you have a brand new device from Mini DSP and it's already fully compatible with Device Console, when you connect over USB, your device will show up on this screen here. When Device Console opens, you'll see the main page, which is broken into three primary sections. The general settings are found on the leftmost section. Let's walk through them. At the top, we see which device has been selected. In this case, we've got a Mini DSP SHD connected. The next button down allows you to disconnect from your device after you've completed your project. Here we see the master volume control. This can be controlled from here or from the front panel knob or from the remote control. In this Dirac section, we have the ability to start a Dirac Live project. And once a Dirac Live project has been completed, turn the project on and off. In this section here, we choose the input. We have the choices of the following Toslink SPIT of AES EBU analog single ended analog balanced USB and LAN. The Mini DSP family includes four presets which can be saved or recalled and turned on from the front panel or remote control of the Mini DSP. These presets can contain previously completed Dirac Live projects and also all of the information contained over on the right, which includes things such as parametric equalizers, crossovers, delays, etc. More on these details later. This section shows the general file settings. Here we can rename the four presets and we can also import and export presets that we have created. We can also reset an individual preset or we can reset all. Reset all clears all of the previous parametric crossover delay, etc. information as well as the Dirac Live project. Here we have the ability to view the current firmware versions that are included in the Mini DSP. This includes both the XMOS firmware as well as the DSP firmware. The next two buttons allow us to refresh the DSP firmware and separately from that, the XMOS firmware. One of the nice features of the new device console is that it automatically updates the device console GUI itself, but it also automatically updates the DSP and XMOS firmware in your device. Now let's take a look at the center block of Device Council. We'll be showing the two variations based on whether or not your Mini DSP platform is Dirac enabled or not. The first example we'll use is the 2x4 HD, which is not Dirac enabled. Here we see the RMS meters for the inputs 1 and 2, typically left and right. One thing to note here is that you want to make sure that you're not overdriving the digital input or analog input to your system and you can verify that by looking here on the RMS meters. You do not want to get into the red and not too far into the orange, so be careful there. Next we have the gain control, which allows you to vary the input gain and get it optimized for entry into the digital signal processing engine. The next section is the two input parametric equalizers that the user has complete control over. You've got 10 bands, you can adjust frequency, gain, and cue across 10 different filters. 
Finally, there's a mute function. This might be used in the case of a one to four subwoofer driver where you only had one input channel. The center block in device console is represented here in these two cells, gain and PEQ of the functional block diagram. Device console for a Dirac Live enabled unit has a different look in the center section. Here we see the RMS meters which are the same, but instead of having gain, parametric equalization, and mute controls, it is replaced by the Dirac Live delay and gain figures. These figures are loaded by Dirac Live either from a new or existing Dirac Live project that you have imported. The functional block diagram for a Dirac Live enabled mini DSP product is different only in the center section here, where instead of gain, parametric equalization, and mute controls, we show the Dirac Live filter locations. These contain the time domain and frequency domain correction algorithms that you have created using the system. It's also important to note here that the Dirac Live test signals are injected here before the routing matrix. Then these cascade through the entire system through your cables, amplifiers, speakers, and most importantly, your room. Now we're going to take a look at the right-hand section, which is the main section of device console. Here we have control over parametric equalization, crossovers, delay, gain, inversion, etc. The example we're going to use today is for a stereo 2.1 system. At the very top in the routing matrix, we have selected input 1 to go to output 1, which will be our left main channel. Input 2 goes to output 2, which will be our right main channel. And then output 3, we have selected both inputs 1 and 2, which are monoralized and sent to output channel 3. This will go to our subwoofer. Now let's take a look at the crossovers for our typical 2.1 system. We'll begin with the main speakers, the high frequency left and right speakers, by clicking the crossover button. First of all, what we'll do is we'll set up the classic high pass filter for our main speakers. In this case, it's an 80 Hertz, 24 dB per octave Butterworth filter. We have the ability to vary the filter frequency by sliding it back and forth. In this case, we'll choose 80 Hertz. We can fine tune it with a little arrow button. And we also have the option to choose filters that are very soft, such as a 6 dB per octave filter shown here of the Butterworth type. Or we could also choose, for instance, a Butterworth 48 dB per octave filter, which is extremely sharp. In this example, we'll stick with the classic textbook Butterworth 24 dB per octave. Also here, we have the opportunity to add a low pass filter to our main speakers. In this example, we put a filter up at 20 kilohertz at 24 dB per octave, which just allows us to eliminate some of the ultrasonic energy that could make it into our amplifiers and speakers, resulting in additional possible distortion and energy dissipation. So we can alleviate that by choosing this. Next, let's take a look at the subwoofer. We go to output three, which is our subwoofer monoralized output and choose the crossover setting. Again, we're going to choose a low pass filter, which is a symmetrical matching filter to the high pass filter at 80 Hertz, 24 dB per octave Butterworth filter. Here you can see the symmetry and the matching minus three dB points of the filter. Additionally, we can add a subsonic filter. In this case, we'll choose 10 Hertz at 24 dB per octave. This allows us to filter out ultra-low frequencies that can cause excessive cone excursion and amplifier distortion. Now let's take a look at parametric equalization filters. We have 10 fully configurable bands available. Each one can be controlled in frequency, gain, Q, and filter type. The filter types that are available are peak, low shelf, 
high shelf and all pass. Let's begin with a peak type filter. We'll choose a frequency of 160 Hertz and we'll show you how the gain can be added or the filter can be made to be lossy. Next you can change the cue of the filter to be very narrow or very wide. The reason for a very narrow filter would be to try to notch out a room resonance or say an excessively bright frequency range in a horn. All of the parameters can be varied on top of one another continuously. And when you add another filter, then results are summed. So here you see a narrow boost filter combined with a broad lossy filter. And the composite here is shown in the dark orange. Let's take a look at low shelf and high shelf filters. We begin by selecting the filter type here. We'll start with low shelf. A low shelf filter is similar to the classic bass control. Here we can add gain to our low shelf filter or loss to our low shelf filter. We might want to use a low shelf filter to add mid-range warmth, so we might want to come up through something like the 500 Hz range, or we may just want to add some very low bass punch, in which case we might start around the 70 Hz range. Conversely, we have the high shell filter, which has the same characteristics. We can adjust the gain as lossy or to have gain and we can vary the frequency. Common application for this might be if we had speakers that were really bright, we might want to start a high shelf filter with just a touch of loss and then dial that down to make the speakers more listenable. Now let's take a look at delay, gain, inversion, mute, and the compressor. The delay setting allows us to add up to 30 milliseconds of delay. This is for synchronizing the time of arrival of audio from various speakers and subwoofers. This will allow us to bring true coherence to the listening experience. Please check out our detailed tech blog and video on making and implementing delay measurements. Next we have gain. We have the ability to set the gain of each of the four output channels individually from minus 72 dB to plus 12 dB. This allows us to match the levels between subwoofers or in multi-way speakers, the levels between tweeters and woofers, etc. Next, we have the ability to invert the channel. Inversion is the equivalent of reversing the plus and minus leads to a speaker. This allows us to determine if our, help us determine if our speakers are out of phase and if in some instances a subwoofer sounds better with inversion, then we can select that and continue the rest of our equalization with it inverted. Next, if we're not using a channel, we can mute it. And finally, we have a compressor circuit, which allows us to attenuate the signal automatically if we exceed certain predetermined volume levels. This is typically used in pro audio systems or systems where abuse could occur. That concludes our brief overview of the Mini DSP device console. Now don't forget to save your configurations when you're done so that you can recall them at another date. We have detailed videos and tech blogs on the various topics that we've discussed today, so be sure to check those out. Also, if you'd like to be notified about new content, hit the subscribe button and click the bell down below. For more information, visit us on our website at DeerCreekAudio.com.